when we first got here, when we first came to Miami, uh, there was a little break, and then we started by looking at this topic of regrouping, reviving, and restoring. It's on the back wall, in case you are wondering, and there is one thing that God was doing in and through our lives that he was assured to accomplish and is accomplishing. Uh, regrouping, we started, that is when, when we came here, it was still COVID, was it not? We were trying to figure out as a church what we were going to do, how we are going to accomplish things. And God led me to a, a little story in, in, in Australia that I was reading um, about a dingo. Anyone know what a dingo is? A dingo is like a wild dog. Um, kind of like a coyote in a sense. Um, they go about and they attack different animals. And one of their prey is sheep. You with me, right? Yeah. One of their prey is sheep. And I learned from, from the sheep that the way that the sheep would actually um, handle dingoes is that when a dingo would come in to attack the sheep, uh, 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 elder, what they would do, the sheep will then huddle together. I hope you're with me, right? The sheep would huddle together and they would stomp their feet, and the dingo wouldn't know what to do. Dingoes would then go around the sheep, but as long as the sheep huddled together, the dingoes would be confused, and the sheep would stomp their feet and put their heads down. The dingoes would be completely confused. The dingoes would go as far as to jump on the back of the sheep, but the sheep would stay in their huddled position, stomping their feet, and the dingo wouldn't know what to do. Hence why we called it regroup. Regroup because as a church, when COVID hit, everyone scattered. When COVID hit, you weren't in church. How do I know? Because we were here. And you sat at home and you watched us cheering us on. Amen. Go on, preach, Pastor. And I'm preaching my lungs off because I didn't know what else to do because I'm told, I'm commended by God, I'm called by God to preach, and I'm preaching to an empty pew. And although you're watching online, this was a devastating, Lanaka, it was devastating for me as a pastor because all my life I'm called to ministry and to preach and now I have to resort to something I'm uncomfortable with, Chris, I'm uncomfortable because I'm preaching and there is nobody here. And I'm still commanded to preach and I'm like, God, what do I do? And he led me to dingoes. And in that moment, God is like, man, that's what you got to do. Put down regroup because if the church just huddles together, in spite of the fact that we might be distance apart, if we just huddle together and we're stomping our feet, you don't get it yet. It's praise I'm talking about. If you continue to praise and you put your head down, the enemy can't ravage through you. So you continue to praise, you continue to be in a prayerful position, and the enemy is confused. How is it that I struck them with COVID, and yet they're still able to praise? How is it that I struck them with COVID, and yet they're still huddled together online? They can still pray together? What is this? And the enemy is totally confused, so we regroup. Regroup. Then one or two, we would come in, even when we're welcome to a church, we see you all drive by and wonder if we'd ever see you again. <laughs> I'm talking real thing today, real. And for many churches, even now, you will know if the truth be told, many churches have never regrouped. Individuals have lost their way. Individuals who have been faithful before COVID, planning and all strategizing, oh, we're going to do this in ministry. I'm a leader now. I'm an elder in the church. And when COVID hit, they left. Now the church is back in session and individuals are nowhere to be found. They're still out there on Sabbath working, trying to build, build back their finances. Trying to see how they can keep their families together. Many divorces happened during COVID. So years passed. And the next year, we had Revive. 
Because here as a church, we regroup, we come back together, we're praying together, we're praising together. We just had a wonderful praise, praise service. And then we talked about reviving, reviving. To revive means to now be re-energized, does it not? It's now to regain life where life once was. So that means that COVID hit and then the church became almost lifeless. Individuals were, were at home. They didn't know what to do. Some are in their pajamas. Some are on, do, uh, on Zoom trying to figure things out. Individuals who are elderly are feeling completely disconnected from the church. And so we had to dispatch individuals to go to different homes to be able to help them with, with technologies to be able to connect with the church. I'm just re rehearsing some of the things we went through. And now we get into a part where, where we're talking about revival, where we're talking about now regaining that passion, that strength that we once had. A tabernacle is known for a lot of different things in this community. And when COVID struck, we're like, man, how do we continue to do what we've always done? And let's face it, this church had been so busy going about everything that we were almost aimless. Or you don't have to like what I'm saying. I'm going to say it anyhow. When you're so busy, it doesn't mean that you're active. You can be extremely busy, but at the end of the day, what is the goal? What are you trying to achieve? As a church, yeah, we have a lot of people, but we're totally disconnected. How do I know? Because when we came here, I'm like, sister so-and-so, do you know this person? Mm -mm. What's their name? And I'm like, how can you be a family and you don't know the person? I've been coming here for 30 years, and you don't know so-and-so? And the ma major problem with a lot of large churches is that you come into the church, but you don't really know. You're not connected with people. You get lost. And for some individuals, they praise the fact that they're lost in the church. You come in because you're in a big crowd, because you can come in, you can slip in, you can sit in the back, and nobody talks to you. And you're okay with that because that means you don't have a commitment to the church. And when COVID struck, that was bringing you down because you had no connection. You didn't know anybody there. Why should I come back? Many individuals didn't come. God help us that we ever get back into a place where you're in a large congregation and you vanish. Lord, help us that we don't ever go back into a situation where individuals come in week after week and nobody knows their name, nobody talks to you, nobody finds out the intricacies of your life, what you're going through, the pain that you're experiencing, the losses that you have experienced, the death and maybe the grief that you're going through even now, and nobody even cares. When COVID hit, when COVID hit, it hit us hard. And then we come to 2024, after we have regrouped, we're praying, praising. We talked about revival, bringing the choirs back, hashtag. Now we have the choirs back. Praise God. We have young people who are singing and young people who want to sing. Thank you, Linda. Now, where do we go? We're talking about restoration. We're talking about restoration. When you talk about restoration, in the Bible, it's synonymous with healing, repairing, returning to a previous state of being. That means that some of the positives of TAB, you're going to see again. All right, you're not with me yet. That means that some of the positives that you remember at TAB, you're going to see again. Some of the things that you used to love, you will see again. In fact, in fact, I must add that there is nothing that God can't restore. There is nothing that God can't restore. God has proven throughout COVID and now post-COVID that he can restore marriages. He can restore broken families. He can restore physical bodies. He can restore finances. He can restore relationships. This morning, this morning, I was just laughing in the lobby. I can be current, current, right? This morning, this is not in the notes, but this morning I was laughing in the lobby of the church because I saw Sister Petty, where are you? Sister Petty, where are you? Just lift your hand, lift your hand. Sister Petty is in church today. Now, why was I laughing in the lobby? Sister Petty, I was laughing because you came in and you were smiling. 
And I said to you, I said to you, when I saw you last, you were not smiling. In fact, in fact, you were there on that hospital bed, and the nurse came in with a little tray in her hand, and the nurse looked at me and said, it don't look that this lady's going to make it. And I turned and I said to the nurse, how do you know that? And I, and I turned to Sister Petty and I said, on the bed, and I said, Sister Petty, you see your heart rate right here? You see your heart rate is right here. I said, your heart rate is too low. And if you don't get your heart rate up and start moving your hand, they're going to write you off. Is that real or not? I said, because the reason why I speak like that is because we have got to know there are individuals who are in the hospital, and because they're lying down on a bed, we think that's it for them. They can't hear us, but they can hear us. The hearing is the last to go. And so I'm like, you better start moving. Sister Petty, you may not even remember that. I don't know. It, it might be a little foggy in that time. But I said, you better get moving, and you better get your heart rate up. I called Sister Bailey in that same time. And Ella Bailey and I were on the phone, and I'm talking to Sister, Bailey, Sister, Sister Petty. And I said, Sister Petty, you better get your heart rate up. And her heart rate went from 30-something to 40-something. I said, Sister Petty, you better get your heart rate up. And her, her, it went from 40-something to 50-something. And then it went from 50-something to 60-something. And I said, you be, you're doing the right thing. And I saw her trying to move her hand. I said, you better move that hand, get that heart rate up. And why am I sharing all this with you is because God can restore. Then says the petty, in that time you may not even remember this, but you moved your hand up and down. And I said, that's right, that's right, you keep praising. And when she moved her hand left and moved her hand right, then all of a sudden she tried to get up. I said, but don't do that. <laughs> and then some other things happened. Some other things came up. And I called the nurses, and the nurses just sat there and, and, and disregarded what I was saying to them. And I said, my gosh, who do I need to call? I said, Lord, you need to send somebody in that moment. And in that moment, the doctor came in. A couple seconds later, after my prayer, the doctor came in. And the doctor said, what's happening here? I said, doctor, look at her situation. And he called, and before he turned around, all the nurses were there. Oh, we need to suction. Oh, we need to do this. And, and, and she didn't even know that I was there. But God can restore any situation. Yes. Now you're here today. You're here today. And you might be wondering, man, I hear that situation, Pastor, but maybe it's just too far gone. My situation is too far gone. Let me share with you under the power of the Holy Spirit that no situation is beyond the reach of God. And I don't know what situation you're in right now and how you may even feel like your back is against the wall. But understand, coming here today is not an accident to hear the fact that God can restore your life, your situation, your finances, the relationship that you're worried about, the, the children that you're worried about. God can bring them back. Yeah. Now, I have countless situations, even here, while we were praying, we were praying about a family member. Uh, uh, there was a mother that came in here and said, my daughter, I don't even know where she is. She's struggling. She's doing all this stuff out there. And we prayed. And before long, one Sabbath, she trickled right into church. And she was baptized on that same day. You may not even remember that. But we pray over situations. And we know that once as a church, we group together and we begin to pray. And we praise God together. He does marvelous things. Here in Joel... In this passage, I don't know how much more time I have, Alexa, but, but, but let me tell you this. Uh, in Joel, we find that he who is the prophet who is sent to the children to be able to tell them, look, in spite of what you experience and in spite of the waywardness and the things that have happened in your life, that God can still restore it. So Joel, Joel was a prophet. In fact, for those theologians in our midst, let me give you the background. Let me give you a little bit, tell you about, about my, my own personal experience, and then I sit down and shut up. Is that all right? I just told you what I'm going to do for the next few minutes. Joel was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah between 835 and 796 B.C. And Joel speaks to a people who had become very complacent and self-centered. They took for granted uh, God's, God's, God's covering over them, and they began to worship idols. They had become insensitive to the condition of their spiritual lives, and Joel warned them that sooner or later, their sinful lifestyle will bring God's judgment upon them. Yet they became oblivious, or, 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 or at least they didn't care about their spiritual need. And up to this time, they had been experiencing great abundance. Can I be real with you? Before COVID, many of us were doing great. 
And like in Joel's day, they had plenty of grain, they had corn, they had oil, they had wine. They didn't need anything. Their marriages were blast. They had fun. And then when COVID struck, when the locusts came, the same people who didn't want anything and who was basking in all the blessings of the Lord now saw everything that they had built up vanish before their eyes. They would go through their outward religious motions because that's what scripture said. For them, that's what they did. They went to the temple and just continued in their rituals. For us, it was when COVID hit, we just sat in front of a TV just because, but some of us, we knew that we still had the bonnet on. <laughs> we didn't show our faces because we didn't want anyone to really see the state in which we were living in. And as they continued on this downward spiral, this crisis of COVID that stopped them dead in their tracks, and the locusts began to come in and begin to eat the crops that they had reserved for a later time. Their finances were struck. And the once overflowing vessels that they had were now empty, and they were devastated. And Joel comes in this same scene in a time when the church was thus ravaged through, and he says, look, I've got a message for you, that in spite of all that you see, in spite of all that you experience, in spite of all that you're going through, know that God still cares for you. And my friends, I, I don't know your situation, but I've come by with the same message of Joel, that God can restore and that God cares intimately for your situation. God wants to fix it, but you got to place it in his hands. God wants to be able to make a change in your life, but you got to allow him. God wants to move you from that dead-end job that you're in, but you got to stand back and watch him work. God has to be able to stop you before you do something bad to yourself. That's why he allowed for that crash to happen. That's why he allowed for that accident to take place. That's why he allowed for you to end up in the hospital. Because he's trying to get your attention. But now that he has it, he wants to let you know that it's only for a time and he will restore you. Oh yeah, he will. I told you I'm going to share something very personal. When we first came here, we stayed on the other side of town in Miramar. And we saw all these people planting coconut trees and all that stuff. And we're like, man, one day we're going to have a coconut tree too. And then they moved the rent from just about $2,000 to $5,900. And we said, we can't stay here. Conference don't pay us enough for this. We got to find another spot. In the meantime, we were all talking about, I even came and I preached a message about your finances and, and, and doing maybe Airbnb in different ways. You remember that? And so we were talking about all that, and I said, man, we, 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 got, we got some savings. We're going to put it. We're going to buy a, a home that we're going we're gonna to have close to the beach, and we're going to be able to transform that into an Airbnb. Can I tell you my business? <laughs> we're going to make some money off that because individuals have a whole living off that stuff. We're going to be able to bless so many individuals, and in the meantime, our rent just skyrocketed like many of you. We said, we can't stay here, Shad. I, I lived on the other side by Shad, and I realized I can't afford it. <laughs> Wilkie, I didn't have a black card like you. And so we moved to the, the, the place, and we started the renovation on this home that we had purchased to renovate, to fix up, to restore. And in the process, I learned some things, because restoring is not easy. It's not for the faint of heart. If you don't know what you're doing, you can mess things up real bad. And when you buy an older home, you don't know what you'll find. Because then you begin to go into crevices and you begin to realize, man, I'm in way over my head. And there were times that we, we were able to accomplish, but what we did, we had a strategy. Are you hearing me? We had a strategy. If we just begin to zone in room by room, then we'll be able to say, all right, this one is accomplished, this one is accomplished, and we can be able to live and still be able to maneuver around our house. We're living in a place that we didn't intend to. But that place ended up being a blessing for me, so when I feel like I'm about to lose my mind, I can go straight to the beach. 
God knows what he's doing, right? God knows what he's doing. And in that moment, I realized all the while God is setting things up. We regroup, we revive, but he wants to restore. But he's got to put me in a situation where I'm actually restoring to teach me about the work that he has assigned for me to do. You're not with me yet. So I'm going through, and in the moment, I've got a call. I've got to go to the hospital. I come back. I'm there with a piece of wood. I'm cutting it. I'm sawing it. And, and after I've finished all of that, God is like, man, I'm going to mess you up. He sent a flood. As soon as we finished that front room, Brother Gail, and we had the flooring down and everything, we thought we can live in this now. The flood came, and the whole room flooded. And we had to start all over again. And I'm like, I'm tired. I've done it now. Called Brother Gale. Brother Gale came over there, him and Marlon. Marlon, where are you? I see you in the back there. You're looking good, brother. And they came in, and they were able to help us out, get things going. But all the while, God is showing me that this is the church. Because even though there is that process of restoration, and you think that it's done, it's never done. Because God is continually working on each and every one of our lives. And when we think that we have made it, we get stripped down and redone every single time. God wants to do the same in your life, in my life, no matter where we are right now. Is that Brother Bedford? That was my Pathfinder director. I had to stop because I just saw the face. And he knows that God has been working in my life. He's not finished with me. God has been working on me since I was a child. And what he does, he squeezes us to the point where we are pushed to our knees. There are moments when I looked around at that house and I'm like, Lord, I can't do it. My wife looks around, she's like, I can't do it either, I'm tired. And we're both placed in a position where like, God, we need strength. Where do we get our strength from? Like, like the sheep who are there... And with their head down, that's what we got to do. If you want to be restored, that's where you start. You got to start with prayer. If any relationship that is crumbling, you know what I ask them? And I have a many of them. You know what I ask them? When's the last time you prayed together? And 99.9% .9 of the time, they can't remember. I want to leave the church. You want to leave the church? You don't want to leave the church. You just want a way out. Start praying. You would find every excuse not to do the work. But God has called each and every one of us to continue this process. God wants to restore in our lives. And God wants to restore you in such a marvelous way that when others look upon your life, your testimony is so great that they'll be drawn to you and drawn to Jesus. Yeah, God is working on me. He's not finished yet. And today, as we continue, as we continue today, I pray that each and every one of us, although restoration takes planning, it takes work, it takes faith, and it takes prayer, that each and every one of us will not give up. We will not jump ship. We will not decide, I'm going to leave because it's too hard. But we'll continue with this work with every fiber of our being. That's my prayer for you today, that you will continue this work. Being a leader in God's church is not easy. You know that this is uh, uh, the greatest retirement year in, in pastoral history. Not only retirement, but many pastors are leaving. Do you know that members have just given up on religion? People who once used to sit next to you, where are they? And our goal, our mandate, our call is for us to begin to witness and minister to those that have left. I'm going to say it again because I'm done. Our goal, our mandate, you can pray for, you play for me. Our goal, our mandate is to minister to those that have left. If they're not here, Search for them. If they're not coming, call them. If they've given up hope, pray for them. 
Those that are sitting in your home right now, not caring about church, continue to pray. And find not only that you pray, but find a prayer team who's going to pray along with you. Because when we pray as a church, when we praise together as a church, the enemy is confused and things begin to happen. And I know when a church prays, that's why this year we'll be praying a whole lot more. You're going to pray till you sweat. And if you have a problem with it, we're going to pray some more. But we got to pray. The reason why individuals come to church is not for a country club mentality. It's because our problems are so great, we're like, the only one we can turn to is God. So we come here because we need each other. Sheep are saved from the attack of a dingo or any other because they huddle together. And if you huddle together, that means that you got to be close to somebody. You can't huddle without being close. All the ladies know in here, when you're in the bed, if you're married, and you're in the bed, and it's cold outside, you huddle together. Can I speak the marriage language? That foot gets cold, feet get cold. You, you all don't know what I'm talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm ending, I'm ending. Let me just make the point, and I'm done. But when you get cold, you huddle together because you want to make sure that you get warm. And that means relationship. As a church, we need relationship. Generation Alpha, who's upstairs right now in Children's Church, do you know that they need relationship? They need transparency, like I talked about before, but they also need relationship. They don't even know they need relationship. They're always on the crusty iPad, but they need relationship. We need relationship. The elderly need relationship. That's why there's a senior ministry. It's all about relationship. As a church, we pray together, but we need each other. We need to huddle together as a family, stay close to one another, call each other, check up on one another, make sure that each other is doing well, because if we don't, people get lost and they get ravaged by enemies out there. That's what the enemy tries to do. Why else would a dingo attack a, a pack of sheep? Because he wants to see which one is going to split first? And you all know you watch the nature shows. That's how, that's how the enemy picks out the prey. The one who splits from the pack and begins to run off is now lunch. That's why I said we got to huddle together. This leadership summit that we're having here is about huddling together. Coming together as a church. And it's not just for those who are the heads of ministries. It's for each and every one of us. Because if you have entered through these doors, that means God has called you for service. You can't say I'm too old. There's no such thing in God's vocabulary. No, he finds a way. Ask Sister T. Sister T, it's good to see you on that lovely hat. Everyone in this church is in ministry. There are no bench warmers, pew warmers. Everyone has got to be doing something in God's church, ministering in some way. That's why this year you will also see the young, the old, everybody, you got to be up here or doing something. If you can't be up here, find an excuse to be, I don't like the front, well, find something else. But everybody got to be about something in God's church. I have a little friend here named Nellie. Nellie's upstairs. Nellie, that, that, your, your mom, her mom is here. Just wave, just wave for us. Just wave for us. Right there in the middle. And what I like about her, she's this small, but she'll find her way to the front and she'll play her little violin because God has blessed her in such an immense way. What is your ministry? What is your goal? What has God blessed you with? And what is it that you're holding back from being used? At this church, we're about ministry. This church is where ministering is a way of life. That means each and every one of us has got to be ministering in one way or form. And I urge you, if you want to belong to a church that needs ministers, people who are sold out completely for God and want to have that, have that passion to be used by him, then you found the right place. If you're going to be a bench warmer, you found the wrong church. I'm being honest with you, but God wants to use us. Do we have a commitment today? Do you want to be used by God? 
When God uses you, man, it's an awesome experience because it means that God can use you to change individuals' lives around you, including your family. Today, I'm going to be praying that God will use each and every one of us in a mighty way, that we'll reach in places, that our reach will be in places, our influence will be in places we never even imagined. Is that all right? Let's pray together. Father, today we thank you for being a gracious God, for being one who takes these pieces of clay and use us to be able to spread your word. Father, today we ask, oh God, that as a church, that as we regroup, as we revive, as we restore, that you will lead us. That as a church, oh God, we will not be fearful of anything, but know that you will restore everything that the, that the, 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 the locusts have eaten. You have promised that you will be with us through thick and thin. So bless us, O oh God. Keep us faithful. And in the end, may you look at each and every one of us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.